So I travel to the west coast of the US quite a lot, and you will be not surprised to hear that there is a new fad, and that new fad is fasting. Some of you may have read about it in the press. So I just want to assure you that even though you're really feeling freaking hungry right now, and maybe that session ran on just a tiny couple of minutes longer, sorry, uh, I promise you that this is good for your brain, because starvation puts you into hyper alert mode. All the neurons are firing. So I hope that you're going to get double from this session because of this state that you're being put into. Um, I'd like to talk to you about responsibility, why I think that we need a movement for responsible technology, and why it's not really just about technology. It's about how we face head on into the biggest challenges of the next decade. You know, when we were starting lastminute.com 20 years ago, literally, we've got our 20th anniversary birthday party in a couple of weeks, which I'm somewhat dreading, but hopefully it's going to be amazing. Um, the unintended consequences of the products that we were building really didn't feel that uh, scary or alarming. And when I was thinking about unintended consequences, I thought, what's the example? You know, what were we thinking about in one direction and something else happened? You know, very often, somebody's travel tickets would go awry or somebody would buy something they didn't mean to. The worst case, I think, was when Justin, our head of customer services, came and stood by my desk one time and said, OK, clever clogs, you're so brilliant with customers. You sort this person out. And I was, as always, thinking, no problem, I can do this. Got on the phone screamed at by a man for about 10 minutes. I thought, oh my god, what have we done? How can it possibly be that lastminute.com has created so much anger for this man? Anyway, it turns out it was the fast buy function that we had just put on the website. Brent, my co-founder, was brilliant at copying very quickly the bits of tech that particularly Amazon was introducing in the US quite early. I remember all of this stuff. And um, we'd put this fast buy function on the site, populated details that you'd used before. Easy peasy, we thought. Well, that was true if you were going on a holiday or a mini break with the people that you had been going on the holiday or the mini break with before, but not, let's just say, if you weren't going on a holiday or a mini break with the people like your family and your wife. So he was screaming and shouting at me because his wife had found out about his mini break because he'd sent the tickets to the house uh, because the last time he'd been on holiday, he'd been with her. So that is quite a bad unin unintended consequence, but it hasn't got sort of geopolitical ramifications, not really. And yet, how quickly things have changed. You know, here we are standing in 2018, and there is no way that anybody in the technology sector uh, 20 years ago would have thought that some of the dark forces that we see upon us would have uh, advanced so rapidly. And you know, I was thinking about these and thinking that they really fall at the minute to me into three sort of buckets. And the first one is around diversity and um, inclusion. And you know, I've just done a small piece for the World at One Radio 4 Today program, because you may be aware that Google employee, female Google employees, and I think probably some men as well, are walking out because Google hid the pay massive payouts they were making about sexual harassment at Google from uh, the world and from their staff. Uh, we live in a world where you know, about 6% of software engineers are men, where women's code on GitHub is more likely to be accepted when they take off their gender, but if they take off their gender, their code is generally more accepted than male code. We live in a world where only 9% of venture capital money goes to female businesses, and only about 2% of venture capitalists are women themselves. So we have a huge power structure problem in diversity, and as a woman who's always worked in technology, I find this absolutely astonishing because it didn't seem it was going to be like that. It felt as though this was going to be a world that could be opened up and could be uh, distributed and fragmented in a way that I didn't imagine would be um, anything other than exciting. And yet there are, as a percentage, more women in the House of Lords, where I find myself sometimes, than there are in the technology sector. House of Lords, 1,000-year-old institution, internet in sector, 30, 40 years old. So we have a huge, enormous power structure problem. We also have a huge, enormous defense problem that I don't think anybody particularly saw coming. We have been talking a lot about things in the West this morning, but arguably, we're not very good at the internet. It's Russia, China, Iran, North Korea who are the real superstars at using the internet and not using it in the way that we would hope to use it here in our liberal democracies. You only have to think about the cyber attacks that are launched on our country and others every single day, or the way that uh, the manipulation of data, news, information, and culture is happening using these cheap tools of the internet. And this is really hard and complicated stuff. And I believe very deeply that we think we're so brilliant here in London, we're creating a tech startup now every hour, and that's awesome, but that is one part of a huge puzzle. 
we're not very good at using the internet in the way that some people with malign intent have decided they want to use it. So there's a big, enormous defense problem too. And there's also um, a problem around the kind of wider power structure of the internet. I still find it surprising that there are a handful of companies that have sort of balkanized the internet in a way. You know, again, I was, was excited by the entrepreneurship back in the late 90s and thought that this was going to be a, a world where you could have you know, individual sellers having incredible um, opportunities and empowerment through the incredible mechanisms that the internet was offering. But again, that hasn't quite been true. And we have massively concentrated power in a very small number of companies. And as we know, regulators and politics that haven't really lived up to helping work through that challenging question. So, what do I think we need? I think what we need is uh, to make responsibility the new normal in technology. I think this is a huge ambition. I think that uh, this is something that whatever country, company, yes, but country more importantly, puts at the heart of how it builds its future in the next few decades will reap enormous benefits. Because I do believe that technology still has power to unleash unbelievable uh, results for us as humankind, and specifically the internet. You know, it's easy to forget that half the world is not using the internet, really. And even those of us who are using it, some of us, I think, would say we're not using it very effectively. You know, I've done a lot of work around basic digital skills in this country, and you know, that binary question of are you online or offline is, you know, fairly simple to answer. Much more difficult to answer whether you really do understand the power of this technology, what you can use it for to greater good. So I think we need a new movement for responsible technology. I think it could be enormously um, exciting and an incredible role for whatever country chose to put it at the heart of how it thinks about things. I would love the UK to take it on and I'm going to fight to make that happen. And I think it has to happen at a systems change level. So all three parts of society need to come together in a new way. Us as individuals, you know, it's not okay to kind of ignore the internet, I believe. You have to be curious about technology. You have to keep questioning it. You have to let it empower, not overpower you. At Dot Everyone, the think tank and charity that I founded, we talk a lot about coping, not coding. I can't code, but I can cope with technology, and I'm not scared to ask questions of it. And I think we need to have a much bolder view of uh, how to help many, many more people in their daily lives understand technology at a deeper level. There is a huge prize for the society that puts it at the heart of how it thinks about itself. You know, we're going to face massive shifts in nature of work. We're already facing very complicated public policy decisions. And yet you look at people working in hard situations, whether that's in a school, in a hospital, in a small business, and our levels of digital understanding are very, very thin. We also need to encourage our politicians and policymakers to be much bolder in how they think about responsible technology, both at an internal level in government, but also more broadly in legislation and the policies that they make. We did some research at Dot Everyone where uh, we asked people about their attitudes to technology because it struck me that there weren't very many independent sources for how people feel about this stuff. There's quite a lot of, you know, Google tells you everybody loves search or Facebook tells you everyone loves being connected. But there's not very much independent work. And the results might not surprise you. 50% of individuals said that at an individual level, they love the internet every day. They love it. Cheap flights, cheap clothes, shopping, connecting to friends. But only 12% felt that at a societal level, it was doing some good. Now, unfortunately, I missed Rachel's talk earlier, but I bet you that falls exactly into what she was talking about, that trust. If we lose that trust in technology, I really think we're in big trouble. And we have to demand more of our political leaders because we can't become a country that goes backwards. We must be countries that move forwards and use the internet for what it was designed for. But if our trust in it, in it is so low, if our politicians are uneducated about it and use it as a bit of a kicking ball, blame the internet for everything from child mental health to extremism to the only kind of austerity issue, turn off the internet and somehow I think, I sometimes feel that politicians think that the country would be better. That's lazy, and it doesn't answer any of the challenges. So the second part of the system change I think we need is to encourage our leaders and our elected officials to understand it better and to build more responsibility into how they use it around legislation, but also the internal workings of government. There are huge prizes to be had if we're bolder, and this is where I agree very much with Tony Blair this morning, massive prizes that we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of. I set up something in government called the Government Digital Service and gov.uk, and through that work with a whole team of amazing people, you could begin to see 
how a different attitude to the digital world could really reap massive benefits for individuals and for society, but we haven't even scratched the surface. And then the final piece is obviously the tech sector itself and the tech companies themselves. At Dot Everyone, we've been working on something we call the Responsible Technology Toolkit. And the idea is sort of micro credits so that you'll be able to assess how good companies were across a whole band of different things around responsibility. It could be, are their teams diverse? It could be use of data. It could be how they design things. But at the core of this is a challenge to constantly put responsibility and thinking about the consequences of what you're building at the heart of how you build it and how you design it. Sounds so obvious, but I feel like I know enough designers and enough tech companies to know that that doesn't always happen. That sometimes you're so devoted to the end product that you don't think about the consequences of that end product. How many of the Alexa designers really thought about the fact that there are a whole generation of children who are just shouting a woman's name in the corner without a please and thank you, and thinking that it's normal to get a result out of that female voice coming from a box. I don't know, are you comfortable with that? I most certainly am not. And that is one very small example in a panoply of different things that you could pick on. So I think it's very, very important that we demand of the tech sector as well to put responsibility at the core of designing products and services. This is complicated stuff, and the ambition is difficult and hard, and that's why the room of people here can really help on this mission. I feel dispirited, and I am an optimistic person right now, that there is so much, uh, so much a lack of leadership in every sphere, but particularly in the political sphere, because I think this is a moment where the UK could redefine itself around some of this stuff. It could demand that we're going to become a modern, resilient, digital-based society. And we're going to solve our biggest problems, not with the tools of 1818, but with the tools of 2018. This is the huge prize. And I'm sure as hell another country is going to beat us to it. But I think we have an opportunity. We have the rule of law. We have a close relationship with the US. We will still have a close relationship with Europe. This is the moment when we can do this and create a responsible technology movement that impacts the important issues of the day. And that's where the brilliant speaker, Francesca, this morning was so bang on the money. This is not about the technology. It's about looking at the problems that people face in their daily lives and working out the best way to solve them. But the best way to solve them using the best of the modern tools that we have. You know, I am somewhat shocked that we haven't mentioned the climate so much this morning. Two or three weeks ago, whenever it was, the IPCC gave us 12 years to get to the standards we need to in order to have a thriving planet. You know, I'm not a climate expert, but I feel that anybody with a voice needs to be putting this at the heart of what they talk about. So I mention it because I do also believe we won't have a shot at being able to conquer that of the, the most difficult of challenges if we don't use technology more smartly if we don't make sure everybody is included in the conversation. And that is about connecting everybody quite specifically to this amazing communications tool and allowing them to have the conversations that will create the solutions and empower networks and empower different types of people. It's hugely important that we all keep fighting for a fairer internet, for a responsible internet, and one that is including everybody from all diverse backgrounds, race, class, gender, so help me, because we need it, and we need some impetus around this here in the UK, because otherwise I think we're staring into some quite dark times. So thank you for having me, and I wish you well on your journey.